What's up YouTube? We have written a book and we are very excited to announce that you can now pre-order this book. What are they gonna learn in the book? Sentence? You wrote a book? We, we did it together. You didn't even tell me. <laughs> Good guy. Okay, what are they gonna learn? So you're gonna learn a lot of stuff in this book. Primarily, you're gonna learn about the causes of insulin resistance. It's a very big topic in the world of nutrition and health these days. And we go into a deep dive here about what really causes insulin resistance and how can you, most importantly, reverse it so that you are the most insulin sensitive self that you've ever been. As a result of that, you'll drop your risk for chronic disease and that's the benefit of it. In addition to that, we're also gonna be going into deep detail here about the, the Mastering Diabetes Method because it's a very specific approach that incorporates plant-based nutrition, but also incorporates intermittent fasting and exercise and documentation. And that bad boy is all locked up in here. That's exactly right. So you're gonna see uh, lots of details about our stories. You'll read about it in this book. You're gonna hear many testimonials in this book. And we have taken the time to lay out our method step by step. Everything we know is in this book. There's 30 recipes. There's two meal plans, depending on how insulin resistant you are, your baseline insulin resistance. You can take a quiz in the book. We think you guys are really gonna love this. And there's also two huge bonuses we wanna to announce to you guys on YouTube. Number one, if you pre-order the book, you get access to live kitchen masterclasses. It's a $297 value. You get a live one with me inside my kitchen. Everything I use, all the tips and tricks, how I prepare my meals. You're gonna get a session with Cyrus and Kylie in their kitchen. In Costa Rica, we're gonna teach you That's all right. about how we manage our kitchen. It's different than his kitchen, for sure. I learned a lot from him, but I'll teach you about Spice World mainly how you can really like harness the power of spices to change the personality of your flavor, of your dishes. And then we'll also go into some specific cooking techniques that actually are very effective. That's right, and if you pre-order the book, we're gonna have a lot of bonuses coming up, but a brand new one which we're excited to announce is that you can win a free entry into our upcoming retreat in Costa Rica, June 22nd to June 25th. It's a $3,000 value if you pre-order the book, or if you've already pre-ordered the book and you've entered your email on our website, we'll put all the links below you are eligible to win a free ticket to the next Costa Rica retreat. If you've ever wanted to come to Costa Rica, let me tell you, A, it's an awesome place to be, but B, coming to the Mastering Diabetes Retreat is really fun. Lots of high fives, lots of laughter, you learn a ton, and your glucose goes from being potentially variable to like very flat line in four days. I kid you not. It it's happens incredible. over and over and over. Absolutely incredible. You can buy the book anywhere. You can get it on Amazon, you can get it from Barnes & Noble, you can it from Target, Walmart, you can get it on Kindle. We personally just read the audiobook. You can pre-order it on Audible if you want to. But here's the kicker. There is a website called Book Depository. We'll have a link below where you get free worldwide shipping and 10% off the cover price of the book. I don't know how they stay in business. I thought for sure offering that they'd have to charge you more for the book, but they actually discount the cover price of the book. So check out that. If you live internationally, you can get the book. Get the audio book, that's my recommendation. Yeah. The, the physical book is cool, don't get me wrong. But the audio book is actually really fun. We added some, some behind the scenes stuff into that that you just can't get from here. Uh, you get to hear his sweet voice lulling you to sleep. You get to hear my voice as well. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We really hope, we honestly truly hope that this process, this method, revolutionizes your health living with in any form of insulin resistance and any form of diabetes. We've seen it so many times and we know just how powerful it can be. In this video you're gonna to watch today, this is a brand new webinar where we reveal some of the new stuff we wrote in the book and you're also gonna to get to see some of the imagery we have in here. So we have a bunch of illustrations that we've put together with a very talented illustrator which we're excited about. So enjoy this webinar, give this video a thumbs up if you like it and make sure to pre-order the book. New research about the causes of insulin resistance and how to manage your blood glucose like never before. There's some fun stuff in today's presentation, so let's go into detail. Uh, before we go too far, I want to introduce you to our entire team. Oftentimes, Robbie and I tell you our story about you know what happened to me, what happened to him, but mastering diabetes is much more than just Robbie and myself. As you can see on the screen here, we have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight core members of our team plus a whole collection of other people um, that are located all around the planet. So top left, we have <clears throat> Jessica. Jessica's living with type 1 diabetes, uh, and she is, uh, she's is she been doing the Mastering Diabetes Method now for over two years with incredible results. Kylie is my wife. She's a registered nurse. She's also got a master's in nursing. She teaches uh, uh, master's in nursing education 
Um, she's incredibly smart. She's the director of lifestyle change here. And um, if you're in the coaching program, then she is your main point of contact. In addition to that, we also have Jose, Jose and Mew, our little kitten. They like to, they like to uh, be photographed together. Uh, Jose lives in uh, Maryland and he runs, uh, he does a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes, um, is an absolute phenomenal member of the Mastering Diabetes team. Neither Kylie nor Jose have type one, or excuse me, have diabetes at all. Adam, Adam Sud, you guys have probably seen him before. He's in the top right. He's lost half of his body weight. He's technically half of the man that he used to be. Uh, he reversed type two diabetes, hypertension. Uh, he overcame uh, addictive food behavior uh, and used to be addicted to drugs and now is 100% clean. Mariella, bottom left corner, she lives in California. She also does not have diabetes, but her, her daughter uh, has, di has diabetes. Um, she's uh, behind the scenes as well. She's an incredible member of the Matching Diabetes team. Then we got Robbie right there. Robbie, Robbie, Robbie. Um, he's living with type 1 diabetes, much like myself. The two of us have been living with type 1 diabetes for a combined total of more than 36 years. And then we got, last but not least, Mark Ramirez. Uh, Mark lives in Michigan. And Mark uh, himself has lost 50 pounds, has reversed type 2 diabetes, and uh, has seen a lot, a number of his family members actually suffer from type 2 diabetes and is a shining example of exactly how to do a low fat plant based whole food diet with incredible success. Cyrus, there's a key member that's missing here. Blue. Blue. I know. She's not pictured here. Oh, that's my man. other cat. I don't know why she's not in this picture. She really should be. Yeah, we'll, we'll fix that next for next time. Absolutely. Okay. So here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about what insulin resistance is from a cellular perspective. That's the first thing. Then we're going to talk about the unknown causes of insulin resistance. Then we're going to talk about some simple strategies that you can use to maximize your insulin sensitivity very easily in the comfort of your own home. And then we're going to go into a little bit about low carbohydrate research studies and why they're actually a little bit deceiving. Uh, we'll go into some detail about that. Um, and then we'll also teach you about a hundred years, almost 100 years of scientific evidence that shows you how to reverse insulin resistance 100% naturally and um, very simply using the power of your plate. So I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this before. I'll kind of give you a brief recap of what insulin resistance is all about. Uh, this is a picture of what is considered normal glucose metabolism. So you have a blood vessel over here on the right-hand side. You have your pancreas up here, you have your muscle, you got your liver. Inside of your blood, you have a number of metabolites that are circulating at all times, including glucose and fatty acids and insulin. So under normal circumstances in a, in a quote unquote healthy metabolism in a non-diabetic individual, uh, glucose can get inside, can get out of the bloodstream and get access to all tissues throughout your body. I've only really pictured two tissues here, your muscle and your liver, because they're both very large users of glucose. So under normal circumstances, the glucose can float through your blood and uh, then the glucose can access tissues. And the way to get inside of tissues is to get the help of insulin. So insulin is the is a escort, and it basically says, hey, knock, knock, muscle, knock, knock, liver, I got some glucose, you wanna take it up? And both of these tissues respond by saying, sure, I'll take some up. So they do. The glucose can get inside of both of these tissues, and over the course of time, these tissues actually start to operate in what's called the glucose economy. They take up glucose, they burn glucose, they utilize glucose, they store glucose, and they, um, they're capable of utilizing glucose pretty much at all times. Now, when you adopt a ketogenic diet or a low carbohydrate diet or a high, high fat diet, they're all one in the same. Uh, fatty acids become much more abundant inside of your blood. So fatty acids become more abundant than does glucose because you get a diet that's high in fat and very low in carbohydrate. So as a result of these, these fatty acids actually are partitioned to many different tissues, including your muscle, including your liver, and including your adipose tissue shown right here on the left. These fatty acids end up circulating into all tissues. And when these fatty acids gain entrance to the tissue, they don't require an escort. They can just get inside and they can get inside for free. So over the course of time, they accumulate inside of all three of these tissues. The only one of these tissues that's actually designed to uptake fatty acids in, in mass is your adipose tissue right here. It's kind of a safe place to store adipose, excuse me, a safe place to store fatty acids. But we're also gonna see in a few slides here that it might not actually be that safe. And there's some caveats associated with that. 
But in general, fatty acids are supposed to be partitioned towards the adipose tissue and only small amounts inside of your muscle and liver. But in a high fat economy, in a high fat scenario, these fatty acids end up in excess inside of your muscle and inside of your liver. Now, when that happens, insulin has a difficult time communicating with these tissues. Insulin says, knock, knock, I got some glucose. Do you want to take it up? And both of these tissues respond by saying, uh, yeah, no, can't do it right now. Uh, doors closed. I am full. I got a bunch of this other fatty acid stuff I got to take care of first. So let me take care of that. And then I'll take care of the glucose later. So as a result of that, any glucose that's in your blood effectively gets trapped and it has a difficult time exiting your blood. So if you do something as simple as just eat one banana or one piece of fruit or maybe a small bowl of quinoa or maybe some rice or maybe uh, some beans or lentils, a small amount of carbohydrate rich food ends up in a stockpile of glucose, a traffic jam of glucose inside of your blood. And then when you go and measure your blood glucose two hours later, you see that there's a lot of glucose and you think to yourself, well, that's weird. I only had one banana. Why is there so much glucose inside of my blood? And the answer is it's not the banana's fault. It's because all the fatty acids that had accumulated previous to that banana had caused the traffic jam and plugged up both tissues so that these glucose molecules couldn't gain access. So over the course of time, your pancreas says, cool, I can solve this problem. And it starts to secrete excess insulin. And now in this state, uh, this is very common for people uh, living with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. They have excess circulating insulin, excess circulating fatty acids, and excess glucose all at the same time. Fatty acids cause the plug, glucose got backed up, insulin comes to the rescue. When all three of these are high, this right here is considered a metabolic disaster and is very common to people eating specifically the standard American diet. So insulin resistance is a pain. It's a pain because it elevates your risk for many types of chronic diseases, including all the ones that you see on the screen plus more. So all the flavors of diabetes are shown here in, in orange, and then over here in dark blue, we have all these cardiovascular conditions, including coronary artery disease, hypertension, high cholesterol, atherosclerosis. So as you become more insulin resistant, then your life with diabetes becomes more challenging. Your risk for cardiovascular disease goes up and your risk for all these blue conditions goes up as well. Your risk for obesity increases, fatty liver, your risk for Alzheimer's disease also increases. And women who are living with polycystic ovarian syndrome are at a very high, have a very high degree of insulin resistance. And finally, there's all these conditions here shown in red. And these are considered, you know, consequences of diabetes and inevitable conditions that you will develop over the course of time, including neuropathy, blindness, retinopathy, erectile function, kidney failure. And the problem is that the diabetes community believes, honestly believes that these are all things that will happen to you just because you have diabetes. But we're here to tell you that these conditions are preventable. And that just because you have diabetes does not mean that you will develop any of these red conditions or any of these blue conditions as well. Okay, so a couple of unknown causes of insulin resistance that are actually fascinating is something that we want to go into next. Okay, so in the book, we go into detail here about <clears throat> what the causes of insulin resistance really are. So you guys have probably heard this fatty acid story many, many, many times up to this point, and that's great because that's it's very important, and it's something that the diabetes community overlooks a lot. I said earlier that fatty acids have an, can get into fat tissue, and they can be stored in fat tissue for long periods of time, and it's a safe place to put them. Uh, that is a true statement, but also not a true statement at the same time. So under normal circumstances, if you have a, a decent amount, a non-excess amount a fat in your diet, then the a reasonable amount of fat can get inside of adipose tissue and can actually get stored inside of adipose cells. However, when you eat a diet that is high in fat over the course of time, these the fat tissue can actually become inflamed. So let me walk you through this process so that you understand exactly what's happening. In step one right here, we have a normal fat cell. So this is, all, this is also called an, an adipose cell or an adipocyte. Either way, we'll refer to it as basically an adipose cell. I think that's the easiest way to refer to it. So this adipose cell, as you can see, is sort of designed to, uh, to store predominantly fatty acids. Okay, And so the fatty acids are the things that line the inside. They're actually stored as this stuff called triglyceride. 
And then there's also some organelles inside of here uh, that uh, are required in order to keep the cell alive. But for the most part, this cell is a, uh, think of it as like a fatty acid warehouse. It's like a Costco of fatty acids. Now the cell is also not capable of storing very much glucose. It cannot store glucose as glycogen in the same way that your liver and muscles can because it's just not designed to do that. This is literally just like a fat sponge. And so that's the way it's designed. So you take a normal fat cell and over the course of time, you eat a diet that's high in fat. So the diet that's high in fat ends up increasing the amount of fatty acids inside of your blood. And the amount of fatty acids that are in your blood, as they increase, they also get inside of your muscle, they get inside of your liver, and they also get inside of your adipose cells. So cells in your adipose tissue actually begin to swell over the course of time if the amount of fat that goes in them continues to increase. So these adipose cells actually start to grow, and they grow a little bit larger today and a little bit larger tomorrow, and a little bit more and a little bit more. And over the course of a week, a month, two months, six months, a year, five years, these adipose tissue cells start to become much larger than they were initially designed to be. So over the course of time, as these adipose cells begin to swell, these, they start to send out these things called cytokines. So cytokines are stress signals, and they're, they're hormones that are injected, that are secreted into your blood. And the purpose of these cytokines is to, is to call for help, is to basically signal to other tissues that there's a problem. And the problem is that this cell is becoming too large and the cell is on the verge of breaking, literally breaking open. So over the course of time, as this cell gets larger and larger and larger, you can think of it as though there's like a net surrounding. It's like an invisible net that's, that's holding this cell together. And as a cell gets larger and larger and larger, sometimes that net can break. So that net breaks, which is this collagen matrix, this collagen network that holds the tissue together. And when that collagen network breaks, then the inside of the cell can actually get outside of the cell. So the cell effectively breaks open. And now its internal constituents, which are mainly fatty acids here, plus organelles, end up spilling into the tissue fluid. It's called the extracellular fluid. So now you have a bunch of cellular debris, which is outside of a cell, inside of the cellular fluid, where it does not belong. <clears throat> and now you have cytokines, the stress signals, which are also elevated because the cell is now calling out for help. So as a result of that, there are other cells called macrophages. And these macrophages are pictured here as, as Pac-Man. Remember Pac-Man from the 1980s and 1990s? Well, macrophages act very similarly to Pac-Man. They are recruited to the area where there is damage, where there is ruptured cellular debris and these macrophages come in specifically to engulf all of this waste material and literally what's called phagocytose or eat it. And by doing so, these macrophages can prevent the trauma in that local area from getting any worse. So in order for this to happen, these macrophages that are normally circulating inside of the blood have to be able to exit the blood and get inside of the tissue because that's where these cells are breaking. So these macrophages invade the tissue. And as a result of invading the tissue, <clears throat> the adipose tissue becomes what's called macrophage infiltrated. Or you can think of it as really saying, this is the process of macrophage infiltration, which occurs in response to uh, broken cellular uh, parts and, and cellular debris in places that it's not supposed to be. When this process happens inside of your adipose tissue, your adipose tissue becomes inflamed. It becomes chronically inflamed. You can't feel it. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't smell it, but it's there. And so as your adipose tissue is inflamed and continues to be inflamed over the course of time, the, uh, your, in, your, your adipose tissue develops insulin resistance. So your adipose tissue becomes resistant to the effects of insulin. And this is a huge problem because insulin is also required in order to shuttle fat inside of these cells in the first place. 
So when insulin doesn't work on the adipose tissue, now you only you have a traffic jam of glucose and a traffic jam of fatty acids inside of your blood, leaving high levels of fat in your blood and high levels of glucose at the same time. So you can see this is kind of like a domino, you know, there's, there's one thing that goes wrong. So there's too much fat followed by a broken net that holds the cell, the, the tissue together, followed by cytokines that are secreted, followed by macrophages that are invaded, followed by insulin resistance, which then sets in in the tissue, making this an inflamed, low-grade uh, inflammatory tissue that has now developed insulin resistance that affects your entire body. Now, this adipose tissue inflammation is something that is generally found in people who are obese. So people who have excess adipose tissue on their body to begin with, and usually uh, in large amounts, um, tend to have a low-grade inflammation inside their adipose tissue. And if you do biopsies on their tissue, you'll find that there's actually a significant quantity of macrophages that are invading this tissue at all times. That's not to say that healthy, sorry, that lean individuals or normal weight individuals do not experience adipose tissue inflammation. It also does happen. It just happens more in people who are overweight and obese. Okay, so that's, that's the story of the adipose tissue. Um, and this is in another site of insulin resistance, which can be, which can grow over the course of time, making your ability to control your blood glucose a complete nightmare. Now, if you notice, the picture on the right here is very similar to the picture on the right here. So the story that we just told is what happens inside of your adipose tissue, but lo and behold, the same thing happens to beta cells. So beta cells are what are the cells in your pancreas that are responsible for secreting insulin. These are the only cells in your body that can manufacture insulin. And these cells can also undergo a very, very, very similar process. And this process is called lipotoxicity. Lipo means fat or fat rich and toxicity means toxic. So beta cell lipotoxicity refers to the toxicity, the, a toxic environment created by excess fat inside of beta cells. Mm -hmm. So what happens is very similar. Beta cells under normal, uh, under normal conditions are capable of secreting what's called a physiologically normal amount of insulin. So they're doing this uh, in between meals, they're doing this at meal time, they're doing it while you're sleeping, and the amount of insulin that gets inside of your blood is just the right amount in order to control your blood glucose at all times. Over the course of time, as you eat a high fat diet, now the fatty acid molecules can get inside of your adipose tissue, they can get inside of your liver, they can get inside of your muscle, they can also get inside of your beta cells. So as your beta cells actually begin to accumulate excess fatty acids, they also start to secrete these cytokines or these stress signals. And these stress signals signal to tissues, to, uh, to other beta cells that they're making insulin, they're making excess insulin. So as these, beta, as these cells begin to grow and grow and grow and get larger than they're supposed to be, than they're ever designed to be, then these tissues, excuse me, these cells, also run the risk of breaking open in the exact same way that you saw the adipose tissue did earlier. So over the course of time, as they continue to accumulate more and more and more fat, then they become lipotoxic. And as soon as the beta cell becomes lipotoxic, the beta cell actually makes a decision and it says, you know what? I'm going to commit suicide. So it actually does that. It actually pre-programs itself and says, you know what? Thanks. I've had a good time, but I'm out. And the reason it does that is it's, it's a self-protective mechanism to make sure that any type of inflammation that's happening inside of one cell doesn't spread and get to another cell. So this is, you know, this is like a, these beta cells are basically salvaging themselves and trying to protect the pancreas and trying to protect the host that they're in by committing suicide. So in the same way that adipose tissue cells broke open and attracted a bunch of macrophages, now these beta cells have broken open, ruptured their cellular contents into the extracellular fluid, and are now gone. The problem with this scenario, and this is the reason why this is such an important piece of the puzzle, is because beta cells are non-recoverable. In other words, 
once beta cells die, they are incredibly challenging to regrow. There's only one researcher in the world, maybe two researchers in the world that eat, that know um, that have had any experience in actually regrowing beta cells inside of humans. Uh, the first one is a guy named Dr. Walter Longo down at U, you know, USC. And the other one is a woman named Dr. Diane Faustman, who's over at Massachusetts General Hospital. The two of them are the only people that have had any clinical success in actually finding ways to regrow beta cells. And there's many, many, many research teams that are trying to figure it out. Point being is that what you want to do as an individual is try and prevent this series of dominoes from happening. Because as soon as this beta cell ruptures, the chances of it coming back are slim to none. So this right here, again, is a very similar picture to this right here. And both of these are processes by which cells are breaking and committing suicide in the presence of excess fat. And once again, we are not the fat police. We are not here to tell you to eat no fat. It's impossible. What we are here to tell you is that <clears throat> there are many negative consequences of eating a diet that contains excess fat. And when you eat a plant-based diet and control your fat intake, you can maximize your insulin sensitivity and prevent any of these, these apoptotic processes or these cellular death processes from happening in the first place. Okay. Let's, let's, we're going to talk about another subject here. Cyrus, that was great. I hope people enjoyed the uh, images, the illustrations, because there's going to be a lot more of those in the book. That's so. right. We, we had a lot of fun creating those, thinking through details to explain a lot of different, you know, aspects of the master diabetes method. So that was really fun to see those being shared. Okay. In the chat box, guys, I want you to tell me, have you heard people say a low carbohydrate diet outperformed a low fat diet? Are you, have you read websites? Have you heard doctors saying specifically, like very clearly the high quality research Say yes in the chat box if you have. That high quality research shows a low carbohydrate diet outperformed a low fat diet, specifically using those words, all right? Zach says yes, Lance says yes, Stephanie says yes, Deborah, Gina. Okay, the yeses are flooding in, so uh, I don't yeah. even see any no's yet, but this is a real thing, and that's why in the process of writing the book and going through over 800 citations, we dug deep into this research and really want to explain what is going on? Why are well-educated doctors, well-educated researchers reporting this information? Let's go into it a little bit. So the first slide we're looking at here, this is a study where the researchers looked at 17 randomized controlled trials. Okay, so a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials is one of the highest quality types of papers you can publish. So they established the criteria and they ended up looking at 1,797 subjects over an average of nine months. And this is what they found. So first off, to fit into the low carbohydrate diet category, they had to have less than 120 grams of carbohydrate per day and fit in the low fat category, their criteria was no more than 30% of calories of fat coming, uh, coming from fat per day. Go. So, I just want to establish that neither one of these diets are the perfect version. Like that's not a ketogenic diet on, on the left side. And on the right side, this isn't, you know, a perfect low fat plant-based whole food diet like we're teaching. Okay. So, but this is the best we can use in the research. And it's still useful to look at this information and understand what's going on. So basically what happened here is the, um, the researchers took these diets, they analyzed what happened to the subjects who experienced them and low carbohydrate diets resulted in greater weight loss than low fat diets. So in this study, uh, the distinction was, let's see, the difference here was on the low carbohydrate diet, they lost an average of 17 pounds. On the low fat diet, they lost an average of 13 pounds. So again, not a huge difference, um, but I, we wanna acknowledge that it's not a perfect diet on either end. So here's another study, another randomized controlled trial 1,369 subjects. This is over six to 12 months. So again, they're looking at randomized controlled trials. And what they found here for the criteria to fit into a low carbohydrate diet, this is much closer to a ketogenic diet, a much better design here, 20 to 40 grams per day 
of cal of uh, grams of carbohydrate or no more than 20% of calories come from carbohydrate on the low carbohydrate side. On the low fat side, those diets, again, 30% or less, okay? So if you go to the next slide, Cyrus, what are the results here, okay? Body weight, low carbohydrate diet, all right? Outperformed the low fat diet by about five pounds. Triglycerides, not significantly significant. HDL, not significant. And the LDL, look at that, an increase. An increase in LDL. This is something we have to pay attention to. We have to understand when looking at these diets. So the conclusion, they say, this meta-analysis demonstrates opposite changes in two important cardiovascular risk factors on low carbohydrate diets. Greater weight loss and increased LDL cholesterol. Our findings suggest that the beneficial changes of low carbohydrate diets must be weighed against the possible detrimental effects of increased LDL cholesterol. So that's a major point to see, even in the researchers who are looking at you know, low carbohydrate diets being beneficial, there's a major concern when it comes to LDL cholesterol. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so here's another thing that happens over and over and over again. What, what Robbie's hitting on here is the fact that when researchers study a low fat diet, they honestly believe that a low fat diet contains 30% of calories from fat or less. Um, sometimes you see it as high as 35%. So they say, oh yeah, well, subjects in the low fat category, we're eating 28, 29, 32, 30, 36% calories from fat. Um, and they got these results. The pr and, and the results are usually quite mediocre. And then they compare it versus a low carbohydrate diet and they say, look, people in the low carbohydrate group lost more weight. They dropped their uh, cholesterol more. They dropped their glucose more, their A1C fell. Um, therefore, a low-carbohydrate diet is better than a low-fat diet. But the truth is that they're comparing a low-carbohydrate diet to a not low-fat diet, thinking that they're doing that. And now the sort of the, the conversation has got to change so that researchers become aware that a truly low-fat diet is more similar to what we recommend, which is closer to about 15% calories from fat. And to be clear, we went through each randomized controlled trial that was mentioned in each of those studies, one by one, and not a single one of them was 15% of the calories coming from fat or less. And one. then in our book, we do a thorough analysis of research dating all the way back to the 1920s, where people did follow a truly low fat diet. Some researchers conducted air, you know, you know, made up a diet that was actually 0% of calories from fat, which is processed food. And, or I think some of the studies got up to about 15% max when we talk about the broad study, but there was a range in between. And in all that research consistently shows tremendous improvements in insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance when it actually is a truly low fat diet. That's absolutely right. So another meta-analysis, which is again, is a, one of the highest quality uh, studies that you can perform. This time analyzed 32 individual other studies um, in which they substituted carbohydrate and fat. They're sort of playing with increasing carbohydrate or increasing fat, but without isochloric effectively means don't change the total number of calories, just do a substitution for carbohydrate versus fat. And what you see here is this thing called a forest plot. So the way that you, you read a forest plot is basically like this. Um, each individual study is shown as a dot on this diagram. And so you have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, going all the way down. These are all the studies. Now, this line of zero basically means if a low carbohydrate diet and a, excuse me, if the study's conclusion was that neither a low fat diet nor a, a low carbohydrate diet won, then you would see that dot right along this line. But if the dot is on the right hand side, that means that the study concluded that a low carbohydrate diet is more effective. And that if the dot is on the left hand side, that means that the study concluded that a low fat diet is actually more effective. So all you have to do is really go through here and try and count the number of dots on the left hand side versus the number of dots on the right hand side. And that'll give you a relative indicator as to which one is stronger. And if you take a look at this plot, you'll see that the majority of all the dots are here on the left-hand side, right? There's only really one, two, maybe three, four, 
five, six, seven studies. I'll call it six and a half studies that are on the right-hand side that favor a low-carbohydrate diet. And the remainder of the studies are over here on the left-hand side, indicating that a low-fat diet is actually more effective than a low-carbohydrate diet. Again, if you do the exact same thing, what you'll, okay, and sorry, let me go backwards here. This is basically in terms of energy expenditure. So what they're trying to say is if on a low-fat diet, you end up burning more energy than you do on a low-carbohydrate diet. And here on this plot, what they're doing is they're trying to figure out how much body fat individuals lost. And once again, on a low-fat diet, people lost more weight, more body fat on the left-hand side than they did on a low-carbohydrate diet. So the researchers of this study concluded, they said, look, we analyzed 32 individual controlled feeding studies and found that both energy expenditure and fat loss were greater when you consume a low fat diet, period, end of story. The data is very obvious and you just have to look at the right data in order to come to the right conclusion. You got this one, Robbie? Yes. Okay, so um, put my camera on here. So here we go. Another systematic review of, this is of meta-analysis diet recovery in patients with type two diabetes. So looking at effects, on body weight, LDL cholesterol, all right? Diets with more carbohydrate restriction resulted in more glucose lowering. And there are two studies with the lowest daily carb intake resulted in the largest HBAC, A1C reduction. So let's look at this here. So um, if you're looking at this, this, uh, this chart here, it says excess reduction in HBA1C versus carbohydrate intake, all right? You're looking at eight randomized controlled trials, okay? So on the upper left, you're seeing A1C right there. Okay, you got two, two dots up there, all right? And the, on the bottom, carbohydrate intake in the low carbohydrate group. So people who had the truly lowest percent of carbohydrate intake, okay? Down there on the far left saw the greatest reduction in their A1C, all right? So you're looking at that data and you're like, wow, I should do a low carbohydrate diet. I should reduce my consumption of carbohydrate rich food if I want to improve my A1C, right? I mean, that, that's pretty obvious, Cyrus. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, the less carbohydrate you eat, the greater the reduction in A1C, this is kind of a, a deceiving graph to actually look at because this should actually be on the other side of the axis. But anyway, point being is that the lower the carbohydrate intake, the more of a reduction in A1C these, these studies indicate. Absolutely. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's another one. This time we're looking at 18 randomized controlled trials. This is 2,204 subjects are included. They all have type 2 diabetes. We're looking at data presented at one year, so a whole year of people following these diets. Low carbohydrate on the left, you got 50 to 225 grams of carbohydrate per day, which is defined by the author. Now, 225, that's a high amount. So that was kind of like the exception study that was included. And then the low fat diet, we're talking 20 to 35%. So this is the control group, right? This is the same mistake we saw previously. And here are the results. So you're looking at A1C, all right? comparing what's happening in the group that's following a low carbohydrate diet compared to a control diet. A1C goes down by 0.28%, so not even half uh, a point there. Total cholesterol, no difference. LDL cholesterol, no difference. HDL, a small increase. Triglycerides go down a little bit. A little bit of a drop in blood pressure. And it's really not that significant of a difference, but again, the key point here, the key takeaway is, we, these are studies that are claiming that a, a low carbohydrate diet is better. This is what we should be doing when they're not actually looking at low fat diets. They're not comparing it to a truly low fat diet. And they're also not talking about insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. They're just looking at the A1C number and that's it, which is missing a big picture. Huge mistake, huge mistake, huge mistake. Okay, so 
let's look at some unknown causes of insulin resistance as well. I mean, what, what Robbie sort of hitting on the head here is that the, the way that people think about a low carbohydrate diet and the way that people analyze a low carbohydrate diet, um, is what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, researchers often make many mistakes and many assumptions. And as a result of making those assumptions, they come to the conclusion that low carbohydrate diets are more effective at weight loss and blood glucose reduction and cholesterol reduction and blood pressure reduction. The, the truth is that if you're actually truly comparing a low fat versus a low carbohydrate diet and you're doing apples to apples comparison, the low fat diet, it blows away the low carbohydrate diet in many aspects of metabolism, including increased energy expenditure, greater fat loss, lower A1C reduction, lower cholesterol reduction. Um, it's just that researchers don't understand what a low fat diet truly is. And so they're constantly making the same mistake over and over and over again um, and coming up with erroneous conclusions. Okay. Now here's, here's something that's actually quite interesting that, that we came across not too long ago because this paper was only published in the last couple of months. And um, <clears throat> what this paper shows is that uh, it says right here in highlighted low carbohydrate dietary patterns favoring animal derived protein and fat sources such as lamb, beef, pork and chicken are associated with higher mortality. That's a that's a increased risk of premature death. But those that favored plant derived protein and fat intake from sources such as vegetables, nuts, peanut butter and whole grains were associated with lower mortality. This is actually a much bit. This is a huge deal because not only does a low fat diet improve biomarkers, does it, you know, improve your cholesterol more, help you lose weight more, improve your blood lipids more, improve your blood glucose more, but it actually can help you live on this planet for a longer period of time. And so this idea of mortality being reduced or all cause mortality being reduced, which is premature death from any cause. That's a big, big, big deal because that's kind of like the final end point. And if you can, whatever you can do to reduce your risk of premature death is a good thing because that means you'll likely be on the planet for a longer period of time and animal derived diets increase your risk for premature death versus plant-based diets that decrease your risk for premature death. Another paper shows this exact same thing. They tried to determine how, how many plant foods were being eaten in a population of middle-aged adults. And the way that they did that was by surveying these middle-aged adults with multiple different types of surveys that, that were very analytical to really like, to really hone in on what they actually were eating. And what they found was that a higher adherence to a, a plant-based diet is associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease, mortality, and all-cause mortality. So less heart disease and less premature death. But it does not prevent cardiovascular disease from beginning. So this is what they showed. Here, incident cardiovascular disease is shown in the first column. Cardiovascular disease is shown here. Mortality and all-cause mortality is shown here. And what they show you is that there's one type of survey a second type of survey and a third type of survey that's trying to determine what people are actually eating. And what they find is that as people become more plant-based, meaning as their quintile increases, they go from being kind of plant-based to yeah, plant-based to like really plant-based. What you'll see here is that the risk of them developing incident cardiovascular disease is going down. Okay. So as these numbers are increasing, they're increasing, they're increasing. What that means is that they're, uh, excuse me, these numbers are decreasing, meaning that the risk for any of these conditions is going down over the course of time. So it doesn't matter which survey you use. It doesn't matter which one of these you're analyzing. The numbers are always going down as people become more plant-based. And this final graph is one of my favorites because what it shows here is that um, they, they sort of graphed how plant-based people were. And what they found out was that uh, most people – ate a diet that was about 50% plant-based right here. So the majority of people are eating about a 50% plant-based diet in this study. And then there's some people who are eating as low as a 35% plant-based diet and some people who are eating as high as 70%. Okay. And what they found is that as you move from left to right, as you move from less plant-based to more plant-based, your risk for all-cause mortality shown here in this dotted line 
goes down and down and down and down and down and it keeps going 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 down. Okay, so the more plant-based you eat, the lower your risk of cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality, which is a big deal. So what we advocate is for people to be as close to the 100% range as possible, 70, 80, 90, 100%. And what you see here is if you extrapolate this trend and you keep going further and further and further, what you'll find is that the people who are eating the most plant-based diets over here, which are multiple standard deviations above the norm, are actually at the lowest risk for premature death. It's pretty interesting, if I don't mind saying so myself. Okay, Cyrus, it's more than interesting, okay? <laughs> I mean, and this is, I mean, that's just one study right there, but this has been, it's repeatedly, whether you look at the work of reversing heart disease, the people who were the most compliant had the largest reduction in their in their plaque in their arteries. Exactly like, right. It's just, it's consistently repeated. So let us know in the chat box. If you wanna learn more about the Mastering Diabetes Method, so if you want us to tell you about the method we put together, in this book, let us know in the chat box, say yes, and uh, we'll talk to you more about it. So in the writing process, we had the opportunity to refine a lot of what we're saying. And so we have put it together into one clear, specific method that you can apply. All right, so Lance says yes, Zach says yes, Carolyn says yes. All right, we're gonna talk about it tonight. We're gonna go in a little bit uh, detail here as we go through the food. So here's the book. You saw Cyrus and I hold it up. The title is Mastering Diabetes, The Revolutionary Method to Reverse Insulin Resistance Permanently in Type 1, Type 1.5, Type 2, Pre-Diabetes, and Gestational Diabetes. So like Cyrus showed you on that slide with the different colors and the central node there, insulin resistance is the main culprit in blood glucose variability. Right, Cyrus? Yeah, that's right. All forms of diabetes. So what this book is doing, what we're teaching here, is about reversing insulin resistance or maximizing your insulin sensitivity, however you wanna look at it. So there's four components of the mastering diabetes method. Number one, low-fat, plant-based, whole food nutrition. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more tonight. Intermittent fasting, which we've covered in several other webinars and it's in mad detail in the book. Daily movement and decision trees. So let's talk a little bit more about low-fat, plant-based, whole food nutrition. As you can see on the screen, it's colorful, vibrant foods that absolutely taste delicious. There's no sacrifice going on in this way of eating. You can see all kinds of mangoes, corn, Cyrus' favorite acai bowls on the screen here, um, kiwis, you got some edamame in there, you got some beets, colorful, colorful stuff, and also plenty of bananas. Uh, you got calorie dense foods as well. So we have put foods into a green light, yellow light, red light system. So I want to ask you guys in the chat box, how many of you right now, you currently see your blood glucose skyrocket or go more, elevate more than you want it to when you eat foods like fruit or potatoes or maybe even beans, or maybe you have some intact whole grains and yet you still see things skyrocket. So if, yeah, that's, that's, if that's true, I want you to write high in the chat box. I don't want to get confused with the other yeses. Right high, if you are currently experiencing that challenge right now, all right? You like fruit, you, you want to enjoy some fruit, you eat some and you test yourself and it's like, what? this is frustrating, I'm seeing a high. You like potatoes, okay? So I see somebody saying skyrocket, high, 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 high. Yes, grains, so Casey says that grains result in a high blood glucose. Yep. Denise says hi, but he says not not beans. Okay, Bert, that's good. Good observation. Carol says hi, hi, hi. Alexis, uh, let's see, says yes. Barbara says hi. All right. Okay. This is the crux of the issue, guys. This this is why this is why we do what we do. This is why we wrote a book. We want to address this. So let's just go through the green light category, just so you can understand. There's there's fruits, there's starchy vegetables, beans, lentils, and peas, intact whole grains. So these are foods that are basically demonized in the world of diabetes health. And as I'm seeing even more and more highs come in, we understand, like we, we get why the, the community at large is, 
upset with these foods, why you might be upset with these foods if every time you eat them, you see a high reading. But the whole point here is, and again, we saw this in the research, it's about keeping the diet low fat. So as we go through the yellow and the red light category, you're gonna see that a little bit more. So what we're telling you and what we're essentially promising you here is when you eat predominantly green light foods, including the leafy greens, non-starchy vegetables, herbs and spices and mushrooms, when you eat those foods predominantly, and you're gonna reduce your intake of yellow and red light foods, that you will not see the high blood glucose readings that you are experiencing. This goes back to what Cyrus was covering earlier about the lipotoxicity, all right? So let's talk about yellow light foods. In this category, these are foods that they're healthy, they're great, we support them, they can definitely be a part of your diet. But the problem is they're high in fat and very small, they're high in fat or they're processed, okay? And, and a very small amount adds up to a lot of fat very quickly. Nuts, seeds, avocados, coconuts, olives, and soy products. So soy products including edamame, including tofu, including tempeh, those are all at least 40% of calories coming from fat. Now, things like avocados, we're talking in the 70% of calories from fat, nuts and seeds, way above 70%, very, very high fat foods. And also remember, you know, there's nine calories per gram of fat. Whereas when you're talking about protein and carbohydrate, it's four calories per gram. So it's more than double with the same amount of weight. So that's part of the reason why a small amount of these foods will increase your percent of calories from fat very quickly. Now, pastas and breads are also in the yellow light category. These are foods to uh, basically be careful how many, how much you have of them. They are in this category because they're a little bit more processed. And we really want you to eat your foods in the most unprocessed natural state possible. So things like brown rice are much better than brown rice pasta. Whatever the bread was made out of, it's better to have that intact whole grain. So instead of having millet bread, we'd rather you have millet. Instead of having oat bread, have oat groats. Those are the intact whole grains. That's what's best for blood glucose control and for avoiding the highs that people were commenting about in the chat box. Now, the red light category, these are foods we suggest you completely, like, completely avoid or minimize as much as, as humanly possible. So you get dairy products, eggs, red and white meat, fish and shellfish. We've put all animal products in the red light category. You know, saturated fat is problematic here. Um, and the, even if you go with, with, you could find like some low fat fish, there's still concerns when it comes to toxicity, like, uh, like environmental toxins, animal protein, TMAO is a little bit of a concern. So really we've taken all animal products, put in the red light category. Oils of any kind, these are some of the most refined foods on the planet. So we all know that sugar is bad, like white sugar, it's just a refined food. Nobody's, nobody's gonna say that's a health food. Somehow, some way, oil has been touted and people have been convinced that it's a health food. They should have you know, coconut oil or olive oil. It's again, just as refined as table sugar. They've taken out the water, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, fiber, protein, carbohydrate. It's all been removed. You're left with just pure fat. You're better off eating some whole foods. If you want coconut in your life, have a little bit of coconut meat, drink some coconut water. If you want some olives in your life, eat some olives. You don't need olive oil. It's not going to help your cause when it comes to reversing insulin resistance and also for a lot of people trying to reach their ideal weight, um, getting oil out of your diet is a big deal. It's the most calorie dense food on the planet. A small amount is gonna result in a lot of calories, a lot of fat storage, and it's not gonna make you feel full. So things like refined sugars, pastries and breads, those are pretty obvious, but we wanna make it clear. Even some of the more new plant-based processed foods, whether that's a soy yogurt or soy ice cream or impossible burgers. These can be great for the environment, great for animal welfare, but not great for your health and definitely not great for reversing insulin resistance and helping you stick to the guidelines that we've created. So the guidelines say no more than 30 grams of fat per day. And like we talked about earlier today, no more than 15% of calories coming from fat. When you eat the foods in the green light category, you're naturally gonna land somewhere around about 10% naturally, just by eating a variety of these whole foods in the green light category. And of course, in the writing process of the book, 
we have you know great editors at uh, Avery Penguin Random House. They asked us to really refine our message and push us to answer key questions. So a big question that people are curious about is, what about fat soluble nutrients? What, how am I going to absorb those? And we have a whole section on that in the book. So you guys are going to enjoy that. Now I want to show you some pictures of these meals just to drive the point home. When you focus on the green light category, you get to eat large volumes of food that are very satisfying. Many of these foods are known as comfort foods in our society, and they are extremely nutrient dense and obviously enjoyable as well. So you have like a fruit salad on the screen, you have an acai bowl, you have sweet potatoes. And again, if all everybody on the webinar is saying, hey, yes, when I eat these foods, I see high glucose, you gotta reevaluate how much fat you're consuming. On the next screen, we have more fruit. We are happy to be one of the most fruit-friendly diabetes coaching programs that has ever existed. And this is, again, an, uh, an attribute of sticking to keeping your diet low fat. That's the key. That's part of the reason why you can enjoy fruit and actually lower your A1C, lower your fasting blood glucose, increase your time and range for people living with insulin-dependent diabetes. You can do that when you've taken out and reduce those yellow light and red light foods. So in this book, I wanna just give you a quick summary of 10 things you're gonna learn. You're gonna get your best A1C in the next three months and maintain it for years. Maintaining it for years is the key point. Reverse insulin resistance permanently and feel the best you felt in years. Again, insulin resistance is really the thing that we're all looking to address together. All forms of diabetes, the one thing we wanna focus on across the board is maximizing our insulin sensitivity. You're gonna eat more and weigh less for the rest of your life. So we went into a lot of detail on how that's possible and why that's possible. And a lot of the research coming from Barbara Rolls on that topic. I think you guys are really gonna enjoy it. We also oh, talked about- Can I take you off for one second? Yeah. Um, you, you say here, eat more and weigh less. Um, one of the things I wanna know from the people that are here is uh, how many of you currently would, would say that you want to lose weight, you want to, um, achieve your ideal body weight and are currently carrying some excess weight. Um, if that's true, write the word weight, W E I G H T into the chat box, because, you know, we say, we tell people that you can eat more and weigh less, but I like, I really want you guys to understand what that means because it's, it's a very strange concept, but it's very applicable and we see it all the time. The chat box is flooding with the word weight. Okay, so if you are trying to lose weight, if you are overweight or if you are obese, I want you to understand one thing. I know that you've probably tried to lose weight in the past. Maybe you're currently trying to lose weight. Maybe uh, you've tried dieting before. Maybe you've tried diet pills. Maybe you've tried fasting. Maybe you've tried exercise or some combination thereof. I get it. I believe you. I 100% believe you. If you have tried some combination of those uh, behaviors and are still struggling with your weight, part of the reason is likely due to the fact that the foods that you were eating at that time were too calorie dense, meaning that every bite that went into your mouth had more calories than your body was capable of processing. And as a result of that, there's a spillover, which means that you end up accumulating excess calories over time and end up gaining weight. When you eat a plant-based diet, especially when you're eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, the way Robbie had just described using that traffic light system, you naturally, without even trying, will start to eat foods that are less calorie dense, meaning every single time you put food into your mouth, you are literally chewing less calories. You are gaining less calories. And over the course of time, that means that you will start to lose weight because the calories that you already have on your body are, are going to, you're going to enter a calorie deficit and as a result of that, you're going to start to lose weight over the course of time. Um, I know it may sound weird and I know it may sound hard to believe or like we're trying to lie to you and so, you know, make something up. Um, if you, if you believe me, if you honestly do believe me, write the word believe in the chat box. Okay. And if you don't believe me, then write the words don't believe in the chat box. Okay. I just want to get a feeling for what you guys are actually feeling because I did not believe it when I first started studying it but we see it over and over and over again. And the research backs it up just like we were showing you earlier. This is great. It's funny because lots of people are saying believe. But then there's also people commenting like, hey, I started a whole food plant-based diet in September and have lost 25 pounds. 
So you have a lot of people in the audience who have put it into action. So it's great to see you guys sharing That's those results. It's phenomenal. I love it. I love it. Reg says, I believe from my own experience. I like it. I like it. People are here because I think we have a lot of people, Cyrus, that are ready to take action. Like they're ready to, to put this put this method into play. To work. Yep. That's what I like to see. I like it. Okay. I'll stop cutting you off now. You no, no, please do. This is good. I, we, we got a, a lot to share. So point four here is that the book's going to teach you how to lower your cholesterol, blood pressure, and triglycerides using food as medicine. You're going to get full control of your blood glucose for the first time in years. And again, we can't hammer this home enough, just like Cyrus was saying, that you are going to eat the foods right now that you are seeing spike your blood glucose. And when you implement all the aspects of the Mastering Diabetes Method, as laid out in the book, and again, we have a meal plan in here. We have two, two meal plans, depending on the level of insulin resistance. You are going to actually see your blood glucose control improve. Eating the foods you've been told to avoid. Eating the foods you've been told, these raise my blood glucose level. I got to avoid them. So you're going to get full control of your blood glucose. <clears throat> now, long-term complications that are associated with low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets, <clears throat> you're gonna get to avoid those, all right? So additionally, you need carbohydrate rich food and overcome food cravings. So a lot of people struggle with food cravings because they're avoiding the foods their bodies are craving. You're craving glucose and you're told that, oh, I shouldn't eat glucose because it will raise my, raise my blood glucose level. And as you learned earlier, it's not the banana that was the fault. It, it's not the banana's fault. It's the fact that you're living with insulin resistance. So that's what we're doing here. We got the recipes. You're going to learn how to implement intermittent fasting. And we have an entire chapter on the science of exercise. Cyrus, what do you want to say about the science of exercise? Oh, that was one of my favorite chapters to write. I don't, you know what? I don't even want to give it away. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we could literally do an entire webinar on the science of um, the science of exercise for gaining insulin sensitivity. It's one of my favorite subjects. Um, I've studied it for many years, and um, all I will tell you is that uh, we'll do it in a future webinar. But it's basically all about your mitochondrial health. Mitochondria are fascinating organelles that are present in tissues all throughout your body, and when you exercise, you can turn yourself into a mitochondrial. Uh, you increase your mitochondrial density and turn yourself into a machine. And as a result of that, uh, your blood glucose drops and your insulin levels drop without even trying. It's, it's amazing. Okay. So guys, um, the book is available for pre-order. So we have offered, we have some bonuses for you. Okay. I'm going to actually make sure you can see this option to pre-order it, but, um, we're throwing in some really, really cool bonuses. We have two special ones to share with you. The first one is the fact that you can get a kitchen masterclass. You're going to have a masterclass with me and masterclass with Cyrus and Kylie. And these are just some of the aspects that we're going to cover. Uh, a lot of stuff people have asked us about, and we're going to go into mad detail and you'll get this. This is for only for people who pre-order the book. So pre-orders are a big deal. If you're planning on ordering it, you might as well order it now and get yourself some bonuses. So we're going to talk about batch prepping fruit, which is something people don't really talk about. And we're going to go through a thorough list of every fruit that can be batch prepped and how to do that successfully so you can save time in the kitchen. We're going to talk about kitchen equipment that we use and recommend, specific brands, specific products. We both have been doing this for, what is it now, a combined 36 years, Cyrus? A long time. Yeah, at least 36 years. I can exactly. promise you, I mean, if you had to count like the number of meals that we've prepared for ourselves, because you don't, <laughs> you don't do that much eating out uh, when, you, when you start to learn how to take control of your health and really actually want your food to taste amazing. So anyways, we're going to share with you some of the mistakes we've made and some of the stuff we use now. Uh, how to save money on produce. Uh, that's a, a big one. Making your produce last longer. We're going to talk about specific teas that we use, ripening tips. Uh, nutrition logging, that's a key one. We're going to go into some detail on that with you guys. Best food storage containers. I've been through so many containers. I'll show you what I use. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping your meals fresh and uh, some supplements. That's a, an interesting topic, which we haven't really dove into much detail, but we're going to do it during this kitchen masterclass. Uh, we're going to show you what we use, what we don't use, what we don't recommend, what you don't want to waste your money on. And uh, hopefully it's going to be really helpful for you guys. 
Wait, Robbie, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I already have a book and I, and I didn't have to pre-order it. Can I come to your kitchen masterclass so I can learn all these things from you? Um, sorry, no, you have to order another copy and give it to oh, a yeah. friend. You're so strict. Yeah, no, we, we're, we're stick, sticking to the rules here. Who is this guy? But I think you know some people that could probably benefit, so you can order another one. All right, all right, all right. And just you know, just submit your receipt number on the website. I don't know how I feel about you. <laughs> okay, so special bonus number two. We recently convinced our publisher uh, that we um, we get to offer this. So we'll be working with Avery Penguin Random House, really big publisher. I'm sure many of you've heard of them, and you know they have some rules and some guidelines. But we're going to give you a chapter. We're going to give you a sneak peek into the book. You're going to get chapter three, the causes of insulin resistance before the book comes out. So the publisher's getting it ready, getting it all prepared, and you're gonna get that right away. So we went into some unique stuff today. You saw some of those illustrations, but that chapter is even more thorough. There's several topics we did not talk about today, and you're gonna get to dig into that research and the science behind insulin resistance. And you'll see on the next slide here, we have more of these images we're happy to share with you. And they're just fun and they really help you remember a lot of these teaching points. So we've had so many of our clients tell us how they just go back and they read it again and read it again and it reinforces what they're, what they're doing. So this book can serve as that manual, something to always refer back to, especially when you're, you're talking to friends and new questions come up and you don't know what's going on. So referring back to the manual is really key. Now you can save 10 to 15% by ordering today. So, you get free international shipping through the book depository. So once you get to the website, you'll see this book depository button. You click that, they're gonna give you a 10% discount off the cost of the book, and they're gonna ship it to you for free no matter where you live in the world. I don't know how they stay in business, but somehow <laughs> somehow they do it. Okay, so, wait, hold on. Let's, let's get a, uh, le if, you, if you do live international, internationally, write the word uh, foreign into the chat box. Okay. Uh, I want to know. Okay. I'm curious how many how many people are um, outside the United States. Yeah. Because so also, it was a good question asking. I'm also going to answer that. One. So Max says foreign, uh, or Ma I might be pronouncing that name incorrectly, but uh, Margie foreign. So, okay. H how many of you guys are going to go order it right now on Book Depository and save ten percent? That's the I question. Will. I'm well, hoping every single one of you guys. So what I want you to do is say, now that you've already written foreign, now I want you to next, I want you to write uh, foreign purchased. I want to see some <laughs> foreign purchased in the chat box tonight before we get off this call. Go to book depository, save 10% and get the book delivered to you wherever you live in the world. This includes Canada. So free delivery to Canada, which is a big deal. It's a really big deal. So make sure to do that. Somebody's asking me, if I already pre-ordered, do I automatically get the kitchen bonus? So these are gonna be live bonuses we're gonna be doing in January. So you're gonna get your link. So you're gonna get emailed the link to join the live masterclass. That's what's gonna be happening here. So you gotta make sure to order now and then you'll get your, your link. Okay, excellent. Tammy already purchased the book. Uh, we have a full, we have a foreign purchase already. I like it. And Max or Max A, that could be it. Already ordered as well. Lauren, Lauren ordered from Canada. Vesna ordered. So that's fantastic. I'm glad you guys are using this this feature. Let's just talk about some of the people who've been working in the program. Cyrus, success is contagious, right? It's highly contagious. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, you got to look carefully on the screen because the pictures aren't that big. Look at the the face on the left. And then look in the, the face and the body in the lower right. Okay, this is David Revist. And he has just had a dramatic turnaround. I was actually editing a video of his today. And he his A1C is now 5.4%. He's lost well over 70 pounds. And he is just a great example, a great example. So he's one of many people. You can see other testimonies on the screen here. Now, we have another uh, screen of slides here. and. It's hard to read the words, so I'm going to read some of it to you. But basically, uh, this woman on the left, she has lost 26 pounds. Her A1C was 9. She dropped it to 6.2. 
So she's on her way to getting diabetes gone completely. So that's in the pre-diabetes range. We have a type two on the right here. They lost 3.5 pounds in a week. Now it's very, it's actually very normal in the beginning to lose a significant amount of weight. Blood sugar was cut in half. And this person is saying that they're eating plenty of food, plenty of food and enjoying it. On the next slide, we have another example of a person dropping their A1C from 6.1 to 5.3. On the right, there's an A1C of 7.3 down to 5.9. But again, we're not just looking at A1C here when we're talking about taking full control of your health, all right? You can definitely, there's a lot of ways to lower your A1C. It's more important is how you lower your A1C, all right? So additional health markers are improving. Cholesterol drops from 198 to 147 here. Triglycerides 228 to 165. She has her um, LDL drop from 121 to 88. So the number one killer of people living with all forms of diabetes is heart disease. So that LDL number that we talked about earlier is a big deal and it's something to pay attention to. We wouldn't want you to trade one disease for another, all right? Especially our nation's number one killer. All right, we have more testimonials. We can go on and on and on with the testimonials, guys. So this one on the lower left here, A1C went from 7.2 to 5.9 in three months, in three months. All right, here we go. We have an A1C down from 5.8, which put them in the pre-diabetes range down to 5.3. So that person reversed pre-diabetes. We have type one in the lower right corner. A1C of six for a person living with type one diabetes is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So I want to just remind you guys, uh, that's actually, that's the last slide. So that's the last slide here. You can go back up. Now, grab the book, guys. Pre-orders mean a lot. Um, this can be a great Christmas gift. This could be, if you already bought one copy, maybe think of somebody else you could purchase one for. Uh, we want to, we, first off, you guys are going to love the book. Put it start there. And we also, for a lot of you on this webinar, you've already had success. You've been sharing that in the chat box. Help us get this message to more people. Join the revolution. We are, you know, we're not really acknowledged in the world of diabetes health. Not really having a seat at the table when it comes to eating carbohydrate-rich food to lower your A1C, lower your fasting blood glucose, lower your cholesterol, lower your triglycerides, get to your ideal weight. And like Cyrus said, eat a lot of food. That's what you get to do here. Let's get more and more people knowing about this. Absolutely. And one thing that our, our publisher also told us to do was to get many thousands of pre-orders. So we're on a mission to try and get 5,000 pre-orders. And the, the reason for that is because um, in the process of getting uh, a lot of sales, you know, in the first part of the, you know, in the first week or before the book even comes out, that helps this book turn into a bestseller. As soon as a book turns into a bestseller, then it simply travels farther. It gets to more bookstores. It gets, uh, it gets um, distributed online. Um, it becomes more visible. More people find out about it. More people's lives change. We're really trying to reverse insulin resistance in one million people. So every action that you can take towards helping this book succeed makes a big difference to us and we really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also, it's at a discount everywhere right now. So good time to save a little bit of money. Absolutely. Let's see if there's any yeah. questions that have been submitted. We can go look. Yeah, let's get to see questions for sure. We have a question document. Um, I'm not so sure if we do have one of those. You have it in Slack. Oh, it, you got it. Slack webinars. That's right. That's exactly where it is. Boom. Okay. All right, here we go. This is from Brian. After five months ago, my fasting blood sugar level was 180 or so. I did a five-day fast until my blood glucose finally got under 100. I take no meds. At the Costa Rica retreat, folks on insulin are getting off of insulin and getting blood sugar levels under 100 only three days. How does eating, eating beat fasting? How does eating beat fasting for getting blood glucose down? Okay, so let's put it this way. 
Um, eating is not necessarily, I don't want you to think about it as though eating is going to beat fasting or fasting is going to beat eating. They're two different mechanisms that have different effects and they work differently, but they both achieve the same outcome. The outcome that both fasting and eating a fat plant-based whole food diet achieve are blood glucose reduction, cholesterol reduction, blood pressure reduction, and weight loss. Those are just four of the you know, top things that I can think of, but there's actually many others. Um, when you eat and you're consistently eating, but just shifting towards more low fat plant-based whole food, um, what ends up happening is that you end up gaining insulin sensitivity. You end up getting rid of excess fat stored inside of muscle and liver, and you sort of allow tissues to regain their normal physiology. Um, that ends up dropping your blood glucose, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, the amount of insulin in your blood, and your biomarkers start to improve and they start to improve quickly. You can absolutely lose weight on a whole food plant-based diet. It's just going to take a longer period of time than it would if you were doing a strict fast. So if you decided instead, you were like, you know what, I'm going to do a, a, a water fast. I'm going to go over to True North and I'm going to just not eat food for the next 30 days under medical supervision. You will also decrease your fasting blood glucose and your post meal blood glucose and your insulin levels and your body weight and your cholesterol levels and your blood pressure. You will. You'll just do it faster because there's zero food intake. There's zero energy coming into your mouth. And from a thermodynamic perspective, if you're taking on zero calories, you're going to expend more calories in the process. So both of them achieve the same outcome. It's just a question of which one's going to get you there faster. If you're in a situation where you got to lose 100 pounds, then fasting is something that can definitely accelerate the rate at which you get there. What we recommend in the Mastering Diabetes Method is actually to do both at the same time. We teach you how to eat a low-fat plant-based whole food diet and to do intermittent fasting and the combination of the two of those helps you decrease weight and it helps you sort of accelerate the rate at which you lose weight. Perfect. Okay, good stuff. Um, Zach asked the question, he says, can this work for LADA? Okay, LADA is latent autoimmune, autoimmune diabetes in adults. It's also canonically referred to as type 1.5 diabetes. Uh, Zach, we have actually, I would argue that we have more experience with type 1.5 diabetes than almost any coaching program um, that I've ever heard of. Um, the reason for that is uh, twofold. Number one, um, we can teach you how to, we teach a lot of people how to determine if they might be living with LADA using a combination of their CPEP diet as well as uh, diabetes antibodies. But in addition to that, we have found over the course of time that eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, living with type 1.5 diabetes, incredibly helpful, incredibly helpful. We have many people who have come through this approach and found that uh, their insulin needs were cut dramatically. You can cut a type one's insulin needs by like 50%, 60% over the course of three to four months. But in somebody with type 1.5 diabetes who actually has a lower insulin requirement than most people with type one, you can actually cut insulin requirements even more. So we have some type 1.5s in our program that are controlling their blood glucose exquisitely and they do it using something like four to six units of insulin per day and they're capable of eating lots of carbohydrate energy and their blood glucose is more stable so the answer okay. is yes we can actually help you and if that's what you're concerned with you can write those. the answer is yes okay and now there's a key nuance here that i want to address cyrus please he, I mean, zach is asking i and this is a real concern i've heard this from a lot of people this is the type 1.5 and they are currently not insulin dependent so the concern is, like, hey, if I start eating all this fruit, all these potatoes, isn't that going to make my existing beta cells work very hard and exhaust them? So maybe you can tell them about uh, Mina's experience. Oh, okay. Okay. So we have a client um, who has a very low C-peptide value, extremely low C-peptide value to the point where her C-peptide at the beginning was 0 0.4 nanograms per milliliter. And that is uh, considered below the threshold of, uh, it's like below, below the lowest threshold. So with a C-peptide of 0 0.4, I suspected that she was gonna require insulin in order to control her blood glucose. Her doctor suggested that she was gonna need insulin. So we prepared her mentally and physically and she, became okay with the concept of injecting insulin. But before we started injecting any insulin, she started to really 
drop her fat intake and eat more carbohydrate rich foods from whole sources. And what she found was that she went from eating about 75 grams of carbohydrate per day to 150 to 200 to 250 to 300 to 400. And now she's up between 450 and 500 grams of carbohydrate per day using zero units of insulin. She has never once opened her insulin vial. It is sitting in the fridge and it will remain in the fridge. Not only has she not injected a single unit of insulin, her A1C dropped from 6.7 to 6.2 to 5.8. She now has a 5.8 A1C living with type 1.5 autoimmune diabetes, injecting zero units of insulin per day. She's never had this good blood glucose control in her entire diabetes career. And uh, she is incredibly happy that she can finally control her blood glucose with precision. And she also suspected, just like me and her doctor, that she wasn't going to be able to do it. And she, the results speak for themselves. Absolutely. And, and the point is, is that you know if you're in that situation, you're gonna really wanna optimize the method and do it specifically as talk because Mina is following all of the four tenets of the method for sure. And um, intermittent fasting may or may not be necessary for some people in type 1.5's case, in type 1.5. So basically at that point, you wanna do three of the four. Uh, that's all you'll need. And the point is, <clears throat> you, can, you can measure this stuff. You can measure this stuff objectively. You can see what's going on in your body. You can get your C-peptide tested repeatedly. And you can, you can see that by maximizing your insulin sensitivity, that the insulin your body is producing is likely can, can remain to be enough and that you're actually not exhausting your pancreas at all. You're not. And that you're actually, in a lot of cases, if you're doing low carbohydrate diet and you're trying to mix in even a little bit of carbohydrate, that's when you're really going to tax your pancreas because of the insulin resistance you have. So hope that's helpful. We'll go back to the spreadsheet that we have. Um, we have a question saying, I need to gain weight. How do I do that on a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet? Uh, the first thing I just want to say, I'll let Cyrus answer that one, but the first thing is I just want to say double double check. Again, you can, you can answer in the chat box, but make sure you're not living with an autoimmune version of diabetes. So a lot of people sometimes are living with type 1.5 diabetes and they have been misdiagnosed with type 2 so they're eating a lot of food, but yet they're still losing weight, and that can be something to pay attention to. So, Cyrus, how do people gain weight in general on a low-fat plant-based whole food diet? Okay, so in general, how do you gain weight on a low-fat plant-based whole food diet? Well, let's think about it from the, uh, the opposite perspective. There's only one way to lose weight. The one way to lose weight is to take on, consume less calories than you are burning, okay? So if your energy intake is less than your energy expenditure, then you will lose weight. From a thermodynamic dynamic perspective, that's the only explanation. That's the only thing that has ever been true. That's the only thing that ever will be true. So if the way to lose weight is to take on less calories than you're burning, the way to gain weight is to do the exact opposite. You have to take on more calories than you're burning. Okay. So if uh, there, I have been in this situation myself, and we've actually coached a lot of people going through this process as well. Um, what you want to do is find a way to migrate towards eating foods that are more calorie dense. That's number one. So rather than eating things like tomatoes and cucumbers and, and uh, cauliflower and broccoli, which is nutrient dense, but calorie poor, you want to migrate to eating things like mangoes and bananas and dates. And when you do that, you, every single bite, you're taking on triple quadruple five times as many calories. And that's going to help accumulate uh, and increase the total number of calories that you're eating for the day. Um, so number one, we want to sort of stack the cards in your favor by moving your diet towards more calorie dense options and a little bit away from less calorie poor options. And then number two, the other thing that you may want to do is increase the number of times that you eat per day. This is actually a really fun experiment, right? Because most people are trying to always limit how much food they're eating and control their portion size. But in this situation, you actually get the opportunity to eat more food. So at each meal, you want to eat slightly larger portions. And then if possible, you also want to add another meal, maybe sometime in between lunch and dinner. And by doing a combination of migrating towards uh, calorie dense foods, maximizing the size of each meal and adding another meal, it's actually pretty easy to uh, start gaining weight. And once you do it, you'll feel like a normal human being and able, you'll be able to achieve your ideal body weight uh, without too much trouble. Perfect. 
Okay, so uh, let's see. We have a question here. Question about the glycemic index and the glycemic load and how they impact insulin resistance. So we wrote about that extensively in the book. And I just want to make one point when it comes to those two things. I want you guys to remember this. The, the glycemic load and glycemic index, both, they're looking at a short-term metric, okay? They're, they are two scales that are not thinking about your long-term health. So it's like, okay, what do I got to do to make it so when I eat this meal, the, my blood glucose level two hours later is good? Okay, it's a short-term question. And that's why something like Snickers actually is quite good. It actually has a low um, glycemic index for something like Snickers. Whereas you look at something like watermelon has a higher glycemic index, okay? Now, what they're missing here is that, yes, you can add fat to a meal. You could add fat to a meal, and all of a sudden, that blood glucose reading two hours after might be better. But what happens four hours down the road? What happens six hours? What happens in the fasting state the next morning? It's a completely misguided system. So a broken clock is right twice a day, okay? The glycemic index, glycemic load, like it can be useful. Like it, it gets some beneficial information by accident, not because the scales themselves are actually really, really good and applicable across the board. They're faulty because if you actually use them, then you would eat Snickers bars. You would, you would add avocado to your meals to make your blood glucose better two hours later. That's what, that, that's what these scales would do for you. It's short term. It's missing the picture of what truly leads to maximizing your insulin sensitivity and reversing insulin resistance. So that's the key point I want to drive home about that tonight. We have more in the book, and I can't wait for you guys to get the book. Okay. I just had an epiphany as you were talking because that was a really good explanation. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the same short-term tunnel vision that people use when applying the glycemic index is very similar to the tunnel vision that people who eat a ketogenic diet apply to their blood glucose management. Because they say, oh, look, if I eat these really high fat foods, then my blood glucose for the next two to three hours is rock solid. Point. I win. I got this right. But what they're not paying attention to is what's going to happen 12 hours later. What's going to happen to the lipids inside of their blood? What's going to happen to them three weeks down the road? What's going to, ha what's going to happen when over the course of time, their brain becomes insulin resistant and they're at an increased risk for cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. What's yeah. going to happen to their kidney? What's going to happen to their liver? What's going to happen to their muscle tissue, right? So it's this tunnel vision approach that most people in diabetes world are always taking where they're saying, I want to know exactly what's going to show me what I can do right now, yeah. but not looking at the bigger picture. And what we're trying to tell you to do is look at the short term. It's important, but also look at the long term because if you don't look at the long term, then you're missing half of the equation. That's right. And, they, and you were going in that, you know, what's going to happen, what's going to happen line. The other question is, what's going to happen to my ability to eat foods rich in glucose? What's going to happen to my ability to eat these well-established healthy foods like potatoes and fruits and, and stuff like that? You know, it goes downhill. So again, the glycemic, again, the glycemic index, it can be useful, but not for the right reasons because it gets lucky. There's better ways to look and decide what foods to eat to control your blood glucose than those systems. So I hope that's helpful. All right. Um, we answered all the questions on the, on the spreadsheet. So I know Kylie has been very active in the chat box, giving you guys direct answers. So a lot of you ask a question, it just goes to you directly. You don't see it in the, in the entire chat box. So um, thanks for joining tonight, guys. We yeah, didn't get so, so there was a question actually from Marion. She says, how can you prove that keto remark? So basically the, 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 the statement that I just made earlier. Marion, I think that's actually a good question. I'm actually glad you're asking me this question. Um, I can prove it in sort of a number of ways. Number one, talk to any person who's eating a ketogenic diet and ask them to eat two fruits. Ask them to eat one fruit or ask them to eat two fruits and watch what happens to their blood glucose um, within the next two hours, okay? Just like we were talking about earlier. In a high-fat environment, carbohydrate metabolism doesn't work as well. Number two, if you look into the, the evidence-based research and you go deep and deep and deep and deep and deep, what you'll find is that people who eat higher fat diets lose their carbohydrate tolerance. The two of them are um, opposed to each other. So when you eat for insulin sensitivity, 
your carbohydrate tolerance goes up as your fat intake comes down. When you eat for insulin resistance, your fat intake goes up and your carbohydrate tolerance goes down. The two of them are impossible to keep. Um, you can't have a high fat diet and a high insulin sensitivity. You can't have a low fat diet and a low insulin sensitivity. The two of them are always diametrically opposed to each other. So if you go into the research and you actually read this, that's what you will find. Um, one of the things that I learned early on when I was studying in grad school was that the way to make, the way to induce diabetes in either laboratory animals or humans when you're performing a research study is to feed a high fat diet. You don't induce insulin resistance and diabetes by eating a high sugar diet. It just doesn't happen. If that did happen, then the research would be uh, full of papers that basically say we induced insulin resistance in this period of time using a diet that's high in sugar. They don't do that. They induce insulin resistance and diabetes using a diet that's high in fat, especially saturated fat. And as soon as you do that, then you, you reduce carbohydrate tolerance, which then makes an individual insulin resistant. And as a result of doing that, their risk for diabetes goes up and it goes up dramatically. So there's many sort of pieces of evidence that you can kind of piece together to understand how a ketogenic diet is actually um, going to operate in the long term. There's very little evidence to suggest that e operating in a high fat environment for a long period of time is um, beneficial for tissues. There's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that operating in a high fat environment for a long period of time is actually detrimental for tissues, including your liver, your kidney, your muscles, your liver, uh, your liver, your kidney, your muscles, your brain, and your heart. Those are very five very important tissues. And there's individual pieces of evidence that show that high fat diets can actually uh, decrease the health of tissues of all five of those tissues. And if you are operating in a high fat environment for a long period of time, chances are that all those tissues are going to suffer consequences in the long term. There you go. Okay, guys, um, this has been really fun. Uh, appreciate you all joining. I wish you all have a great hol holiday season here. It's coming yes. up. Thank you guys so much for showing up. I really appreciate it. We had a great time tonight and I hope you guys learned something in the process. Okay. And let's see if, if you bought the book tonight, I want you to write tonight in the chat box. Ooh, that's a good one. Right tonight. And so, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry. I think you sent that to one person, not to everybody. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> all right good good guys um good really night. really g glad to see you guys uh we appreciate your support and we know you're gonna we're gonna love the book we're really really confident in that there's and, no question um sharon said that about the book will be shipped uh no will not be shipped until february 18th is there any way to get it sooner? Unfortunately, Sharon, there is no way to get it sooner. We can't even get a copy in on our hands sooner than that because yeah. that's the release date. So everybody has to wait until that date. My my family members, my cats, they all have to wait until that date too. Yep. Yeah, they haven't they haven't even printed the hardcover yet. So we we are everybody's waiting for that. We're all we're all <laughs> the same boat. <laughs> but this is great to see, guys. I'm seeing a lot of tonight's. This is really, really wonderful. Mazel says we'll order out the webinar ends. Thank you so much, Mazel. Appreciate it. Cool. All right, guys. Have a great night. It's been fun hanging out, and um, we will see you in the near future again. See ya. Take care, guys.